to know we can obtain help and mercy and grace in the time of need. We need you, Lord. I pray you administer in every one of these requests. I pray for Ashley, that you would heal him. You would work a miracle in Ashley's life, Lord Jesus. Do this miracle, we pray, only you can do. I pray for revival at Beech Tree. I pray, God, you'd use my mom and Sister Pat to minister to them and help them to know you like they are blessed to know you. I pray for the gentleman on the pipeline. You can heal him of cancer. I know you can do it, God. Nothing is too hard for you. Please work this miracle, God. Bolster his faith. I pray for Christy. You know what's going on in her body, and you're able to heal her. I pray you do this today for your glory and for her faith. Sister Jackie needs a healing touch. God, please minister to her and bless her. Heal her foot as it recovers. We pray you would work this miracle. We give you praise and thanks for it. I pray for Edgar. You're able to heal him. Jesus, you're greater than the grave. Certainly, you're greater than disease. And I also pray, minister, today in our Bible study, speak to us, Lord. Let us hear your voice. I pray for my friend Josh, that you would heal him. God, you can heal a tumor. Nothing is too hard for you to do. We lift him up before you and ask you to heal him and work this miracle. And we give you thanks and praise for what you're going to do. We honor you and worship you tonight, Jesus. Have your way, Lord God. Be glorified, be lifted up, be magnified in the name of Jesus. We praise you tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now let's give thanks to the Lord that he does hear us every time we pray. So good, so faithful. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. So tonight, we are in Acts chapter 20. We've been studying and walking through the book of Acts. We're all the way in chapter 20, so we're in the last decade, basically, of the book of Acts. And it starts off, of course, of course, rather, verse number 1, Acts 20. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself, embraced them, and departed to go to Macedonia. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. And here we go. Here's the fun list. Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, and Gaius of Derby, and Timothy and Tychicus and Trophimus of Asia. Aren't you glad for your name? Yes. That's right. <laughs> These men going ahead waited for us at Troas, but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas, where we stayed seven days. It's kind of like Luke is just walking around with Paul with a day timer or a planner <laughs> recorder saying, okay, five days here, seven days here. And his, yeah, his itinerary, Luke was Paul's personal assistant. Oh, Luke, go ahead and write this down. We're going to go get some subs. He was, he was there with him. So in the last chapter, in chapter 19, it, the, the first chapter, or the first verse of chapter 20 says, after the uproar had ceased. Chapter 19 records the uproar. What was the uproar from last week? Do you remember how chapter 19 ends? Yep. 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 They were in an arena. They were, that's right, exactly. They were in an arena in Ephesus and they were screaming out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. For two solid hours, they were screaming, chanting, roaring, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. They're trying to beat and humble all of these Jesus followers and show them who's boss, who's in charge around here. But Acts 20 opens up with, after the uproar had ceased. When I read that, I thought, I wish I had read that during the height of the pandemic. Because I'm sure for those Christians who are in the arena thinking that they might be arrested, beaten, executed for two hours, 120 minutes, that's a long time for the uproar to go on. But eventually, it did end. I felt like we we're going to go through COVID forever. But the uproar ceased. And the Lord is letting us know the uproar always ceases. It will not go on forever. What makes national news today may not even make local news tomorrow. So take heart, the uproar always ceases. So here's Paul. Paul heads from Ephesus and he wants to go up here, but as he comes up here, he finds out there's a plot against his life. And so he knows if he goes up this way and he comes back down towards Syria, there's a plot, they're gonna try to kill him once he gets on the boat. So Paul says, well, let's change plans a little bit. An attempt on your life causes you to do that. So he changed his plans, and he started heading toward Corinth. And do you know what powerful, wonderful, life-changing, world-changing letter Paul wrote from Corinth? No, no. From Corinth. 
the letter to the no no Romans is right the letter to the Romans remember Paul he wrote about all these sensual things that were going on sinful things going on and it's as if he's just looking out the window in Corinth and saying wow look at what these people are doing do you realize if you do these things you cannot have a right relationship with God you've got to turn from those things so Paul wrote the letter to the Romans from Corinth so Paul has a few travel buddies to go with him he's built up quite the dream team I'm gonna write these down he has Sopater of Berea he has Aristarchus and Secundus Gaius, he has Tychicus, Timothy, and my buddy, Trophimus. Now here's the beauty of the gospel. Aristarchus is the name that belongs to the aristocracy, the ruling class. These are the guys who are in charge. These are the guys with influence and power. That's Aristarchus. So he's from the upper crust. Secundus is the rank of a slave. The, the first slave in the house, let's say the guy in charge of the slaves, his name would, or his rank would have been Primus, or the first one. But Secundus, those are the ones who are under him, the lower level slaves. So he's not even the, the top slave, he's a lower level slave. So he's from the lower crust of society. But here's the beauty about it. Society draws a line between Aristarchus and Secundus and says these guys can't hang out together, but the gospel erases that line and says both of these guys are welcome at the foot of the cross. That's what the gospel does. The gospel erases the line. So, and in their culture, it was never customary for a slave and their masters or owners or the aristocracy, the ruling class, to eat together because it would have been considered beneath the ruling class. And yet here they fellowship together and they worship together because the, the cross, it levels the playing field. It levels everything. Now, did you happen to notice as we were reading that Paul said, or rather Luke, in verse 5, said these men going ahead waited for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi. Who joins the party? Luke joins the party. So Luke, of course, we've got Paul. I can't put Paul at the bottom, so let's just put Paul up here at the top. He's kind of primus. Paul, Luke, and then all these other guys are all part of this dream team that Paul has built for the glory of God. And remember, it all starts with Paul. It starts with Paul receiving the Holy Spirit and a revelation of who Jesus really is. And he's going through these cities and synagogues and places. He's building this team for the glory of God. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, including Aristarchus and Secundus coming together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. We'll dismiss at 8.30 tonight. You are welcome. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together, and in a window sat a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embraced him, saying, Don't trouble yourselves. His life is still in him. But when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak. How long is that? Midnight to daybreak. Six, seven, That's about six or seven hours. And Paul had preached already up until midnight. Goes down, prays for a guy. God raises him from the grave. And then he preaches again another six or seven hours. That's, that is a lot of water. Yeah. <laughs> then he departed. Was that? They did break after. They did. They had fellowship together. Yep. They broke bread together. And then he's right. He's like, well, now that your bellies are full and the lamps are burning, let me preach a little more. Exactly. But after you see a guy fall asleep and fall out the window and die, you're like, well, I'm not. I'm not falling asleep. I'll do everything I can to stay awake. I might fall asleep, but not in the window. They brought the young man. Yes, they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Now we're going to do a little Bible study within a Bible study. This reference here in verse 7 is the first reference to the first time the, fir the church comes together on the first day of the week. Now, Old Testament scholars, we know there's a special day of the week in the Old Testament in the covenant God had made with Israel. What day was that? The, sab the Sabbath day, the seventh day. So in the Old Testament, the seventh day, I'm running out of ink. The seventh day Sabbath was valuable and was was revered as holy. And it makes God's top 10 list 
remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. It's a major tenet, but it's not the only tenet. One of my officers, and I got his permission to tell the story, one of my officers was helping somebody had filed a complaint. Somebody had lied to him about some things, and so he wanted to file a complaint and report about it. So he did. Filed the complaint. The officer helped him, and he said, well, man, thank you so much. You've really helped me. That man really lied to me. And the officer said, well, happy to help. And he said, and then the guy said, one more thing. Do you know the biggest lie in the world? And the officer said, no, sir. That you're supposed to worship on Sunday, not Saturday. And my officer thought, oh, no. Like he has been reeled in and there's no backing out of this one. He's, he, is, he is captive. And so he went on to explain that Saturday was the day we're supposed to worship and not Sunday. And obviously we, we are in a city where there are a lot of people, namely Seventh-day Adventists, who that is one of their major convictions and one of their major tenets. I don't, maybe you've seen this billboard before. This billboard or similar one to it was here on 13 not long ago. Saturday, the true Lord's Day, changed by the Antichrist, avoid his mark that some believe that worshiping on Sunday is actually the mark of the beast. Wow. So there's this concept, and of course, you know, if you believe that, then of course you're going to fight for it because that's a pretty ardent belief. And we have several devout and committed, consecrated, sincere Seventh-day Adventists. The problem is they have made their whole identity tied up into which day, ending in Y, is the best day. But that, that seems trite compared to the gospel compared to who Jesus is and how we are made right with him. So why did the first century church meet on the first day of the week to worship together, not on the seventh day of the week? And while you think about that, let me find another marker. Okay, so it, it could be that they were giving God the first day as opposed to the last day of the week. So it could be a matter of priority, primacy. Of giving them the right. But in the Old Testament, it, God was okay with the seventh day being the Sabbath day. Because Jesus rose from the grave on the first day of the week. What else happened on the first day of the week? Pentecost, Pentecost happened on the first day of the week. So if the first day of the week, yes, I believe so. When Jesus rose from the grave, and I'm pretty sure Pentecost was on the first day of the week. Maybe not, 50 days after Passover? No, so it'd be, that would have been, that would have been a Saturday. Yes, exactly. So Jesus rose from the grave, pours out his spirit on the first, or the seventh, or the seventh day of the week. Yes. You're still right, though, because 50 days, 49 days, and seven weeks plus one day. So Passover was. Passover was Friday. Well, either way, Jesus, he sets the rules when he rises from the grave on the first day of the week. Now, certainly he could have risen from the grave and set it on the seventh day, but he chose the first day. And we covered this when we were talking in Colossians. Remember Paul said, oops, sorry. Paul said in Colossians 2, let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths. So we could say as Jesus rose on the first day of the, the grave, rather on the first day of the week, the church began to meet together on the first day of the week, that God was signaling a new day, a new era, a new time, a new covenant with his people in which a, a new day would have primacy and would have priority, not the seventh day, Sabbath, but the first day. And I had somebody who came to me one time and said, man, when, Sunday is no day of rest. I have to come to church and I have to practice and I have to be here and I have to do this. And blah, blah, blah. I said, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. I think you're misunderstanding something here. Sunday is a day we come together and worship God together. You want a day of rest. Saturday is your day of rest. And if you took your, your kids to four different ball games and practices all Saturday, don't blame God for that. If you didn't rest bodily when you could have rested on Saturday, don't tell God I'm not coming to your house on Sunday because I need my day. So, well, we covered this in, in Colossians. Paul even said, don't let anybody judge you. If you keep the Sabbath day, God bless you. If you don't keep the Sabbath day, God bless you. But you worship together, come together, and worship God together. Some churches in our culture can only meet on Fridays or Saturdays because they rent a building from another church who has their services on Sunday. Are they out of the will of God? Not at all. There's, to God, every day is a day of worship. And it's in a day of rest because we have the Holy Spirit that gives us rest every day of our lives. But the calendar has been changed so many times. It has, yeah. We don't really even know where we're at. We have a Roman calendar, a Julian calendar, a Gregorian calendar, a Hebrew calendar. We have all kinds of calendars. 
The most important thing is every day is a day of worship unto God. We need to come together. This is encouraging for us. We strengthen one another. We bring our faith. We braid our faith together when we pray together and worship together. We need to come together. And so in America, in our culture, or even around the world, that is Sunday, primarily because Jesus rose from the grave on Sunday. But anybody who makes the main issue of our faith a day of a week or anything like that that is short of the gospel, we have lost focus on what Jesus came to do and why he came to give his life. Now, and I do cover a lot more about the Sabbath day in my book. I've always wanted to say that. Like I could talk about this a little more in my book, so you can pick up 10 words. And that's available in the bookstore or paragraphs. So that's a little short Bible study nested in a longer Bible study about the seventh day. So if somebody comes up to you and says, we're supposed to worship on Saturday, say, I believe that, and Sunday, and Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. So on the first day of the week, they're gathered together for service in a house church. And like a novelist, Luke sets the scene and he sets it beautifully. He says, here it was. It was a Sunday night. And in their culture, by the way, Sunday was a work day. So they would work all day Sunday. They would come to service at night, Sunday night. They've worked all day. They're in a third floor room. We all know heat rises. And then there are many oil lamps burning in the room to keep everything lit, but also keep it warm. So it is hot, hot up there. Worked all day, you're in a third floor room, heat rises, oil lamps, and you got a guy preaching a long sermon. You add those together, and it's chin on chest all over the place. How many, let's, how many of you ever watched somebody doze in church? <laughs> on a show of hands, how many have dozed in church? <laughs> you start off, the word that's used there in Acts 20 that he began to be overcome with sleep literally means gradually. You can watch Eutychus just kind of go like this. And that nod. Yeah. You either end up, the, the, the logical end of that is chin on chest or head on the back of the chair. That's just kind of how it happens. And that's right. And he's three, three floors up. He's sitting in a window, no glass, just sitting in a window on a ledge. And poor Eutychus starts to doze. Somebody made a joke and they said his name is called Eutychus because Eutychus too, if you fell three stories out of a window. <laughs> but when you add all those factors together, Eutychus, Eutychus would not have even been a footnote in the scripture if he wasn't sitting in the window. But because he's sitting in the window, he falls asleep, falls three stories to his death. He hits the street. Now that's something you never put on the service schedule. Nobody says, all right, tonight we're going to have two songs, an offering, a couple more songs, preaching, the guy's going to die, altar call, dismissal, God's going to bring him back from the grave. Announcements. But that's what happened. Eutychus, also ironically speaking, Eutychus' name means lucky. <laughs> yeah. So Eutychus falls, three flights, dies. Paul stops preaching long enough to go down, pray for him. And here, we've seen Paul so far. He is traveling thousands of miles to preach the gospel. He's a pastor. He's a church planter. He's a powerful man of God, used by God. Here we see, we see a tender side of Paul. We see a, a compassionate side. The scripture says he, he embraced him. He laid over on him and prayed for God to bring him back to life. He could have just stood there and said, In the name of Jesus, rise. But Paul loved. He was probably around 8 to 14 years old, Eutychus was. And God raised him from the grave. He was a young man, just probably 8 to 14. He did. Elisha, one of the, the Shunammite woman, had a son who died. And Scripture says Elijah came and put his hands on his hands and his mouth on his, basically worked mouth to mouth, CPR, in the Old Testament, but prayed and God brought him back to life. So we see this kind of pattern of kindness and compassion Paul had. So Paul goes back up. They're like, hey, what happened to Eutychus? Oh, I died. He's good. He's back. And they ate. They broke bread together. They had communion together. They fellowshiped together. And Paul said, well, since we're all here, I got another 28 pages of notes, so let's go through this. And so Paul continued preaching all the way until daybreak. But he did that because he knew this is the last time I'm going to see these people. He knows when he leaves Troas, that's, the, that's it. He'll never see them again. So he gave them everything he had to make sure they were ready to meet God and he could make sure that they had everything they needed to live their life for Jesus. Any questions before we move on? Okay, verse number 13. Then we, Luke is with them, went ahead to ship and sailed to Assos. They're intending to take Paul on board. For so he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. 
He met us at Assos. We took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day, we arrived at Samos and then stayed at Trogilium. <laughs> and then we went to Miletus. I'm glad our town is Mount Vernon. That's so much better. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so he would not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Paul and his pals are moving again. They're sailing. He's walking. So Paul tells them, why don't you guys get on a boat and I'll meet you over at Assos. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk it. 20 miles. Paul's going to hoof it. Maybe he just wanted to pray, clear his mind, think. Maybe he wanted to talk to people along the way, share the gospel with people as he was walking along the way. For whatever reason, Paul walked and they sailed. And they met up at Assos. Then he got on board the boat. They sailed to Mytilene, Kyle, Samos, Tregillium. Tregillium sounds a little bit like a creature from the Lord of the Rings or something. Then they came to Miletus. And, and Paul said, I'd oh, I want to go to Ephesus. I love Ephesus. They're my favorite people, my favorite church, my favorite city. But I can't go. Because Paul knew if I go to Ephesus, I won't leave Ephesus anytime soon. And I'm on a tight schedule. I've got to get to Jerusalem. I want to go on the day of Pentecost. You ever... See somebody's name come up on a caller ID and you're like, oh, I don't have an hour and a half. I, I would answer, but I just can't. Well, that's kind of how Paul that's kind of how Paul thought. If I go to Ephesus, I'm not getting out of there anytime soon. I, I, I just I want to, but I just can't go. I've got to get to Jerusalem for Pentecost. So from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And they came to him and he said to them, You know, from the first day I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, <laughs> repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now see I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city. This is what's waiting on you, Paul. Good stuff. Chains and tribulations. Oh, it's going to be good. But none of these things move me, neither do I count my life dear to myself, so I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul was Paul. Paul knew Paul. Paul lived with Paul for a long time. And Paul thought, if I go to Ephesus, man, I'm just, I love those people too much. I'm going to get sucked in and I won't be able to leave. So rather than go to Ephesus, he called for the Ephesian leaders to come and meet him. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm not going to come to you. You have to come to me. You have to come 30 miles to where I am, but it'll be worth it. Just meet me. The scripture calls them, the scripture calls them elders. Does anybody remember from a previous study what an elder was? Yes. Elder and bishop is a synonymous term. There's one more New Testament term which is synonymous with that. What are those? No. Episcopos is bishop. But good Greek, I'm impressed. Think of our context, the local church pastor. That's right. These were synonymous terms in the New Testament, elders, bishops, pastors. So Paul's calling these pastors from the Ephesus church, the house churches, to come together so they can, he can talk with them. And they met up with Paul. And Paul, the super apostle, the church planner, the pastor, the one who studied at Jesus University for three years, shows us the softer side. He loved these pastors, loved this city, loved this church. And Paul said, I discipled you, and he mentions two ways. He said, I discipled you publicly and house to house. If anybody tells you we don't need one of these, they don't understand discipleship. Before the pandemic, a lot of people were saying, I'm good. I'll go to church on TV. I'll go to church on the Internet. I'm good. No, we need this. We need publicly. We need to come together corporately. We need to worship God together. We need to fellowship together. We need each other. But if the only thing we have, our relationship with God, is Sunday and Wednesday, then we're missing this altogether. We need this. We need to take this home, and we need to bring what we have from home here when we come together. We need publicly, and we need house to house. Where do they meet publicly? They didn't have a church building that was all their own, so where do they meet publicly? In the synagogue, they would meet in the synagogue. House to house, they would just go to each other's house. They'd have fellowship, they'd have worship, they'd have discipleship, they'd teach each other, they would share scripture with one another. They did this together. We need both. The pandemic taught us we could lose our building like that. We could lose it for 70 days, which we did. 
And so if we lose our building, we can't lose discipleship. We can't lose our relationship with God. That comes house to house. So if persecution or a pandemic or a natural disaster took our building tomorrow, we can still walk close with God and with one another because we still have our homes. We still have discipleship. And so that's how we continue. And as the church grows larger, the best way to still stay small is house to house. Small groups, life groups where we gather together devotionally and share fellowship, worship, discipleship, one with another. Paul said, I preach to everybody. I preach to the Jews. I preach to the Greek. I preach to everywhere, publicly, house to house. The gospel Paul preached was a gospel worth dying for. There is one gospel worth dying for, and it's the one Jesus died for. That's the only gospel. Not the gospel of self-help or the gospel of prosperity or the gospel of health and wealth or the gospel of social justice or the gospel of social economic reform. None of those gospels are worth dying for. The one he died for, that's the only one. Charles Spurgeon wrote it well. He said, well, he said, there was once in the church a gospel which believers hugged to their hearts as if it was their soul's life. There used to be a gospel in the world which provoked enthusiasm and commanded sacrifice. Tens of thousands have met together to hear this gospel at the peril of their lives. Men to the teeth of tyrants have proclaimed it and have suffered the loss of all things and gone to prison and death for it, singing psalms all the while. Is there not such a gospel remaining? What a statement. Is there a gospel yet remaining worth living for and dying for? Is there not? Which is the gospel? That he died, he was buried, he rose from the grave. That's the only gospel. Oh, nope, nope. No, there's no other gospel. Paul even said, if I or an angel from heaven preach another gospel, let him be accursed. He said it twice in one, one passage. The only gospel is the gospel of Jesus. So Paul, heading for Jerusalem, he knows his days are numbered. He knows when he gets to Jerusalem, he will be arrested, likely beaten, probably executed. But he said, none of that moves me. I'm not scared. I'm not intimidated. I don't even count my life dear. What I do count dear is the opportunity to share the gospel, to share Jesus with others. That's an amazing relationship with God and confidence that I've got him and he's got me. Right. Yes. He even said so in another epistle. He said, it's better for me that I depart. I'd love to go and see Jesus. Wow, that'd be wonderful. But it's better for you that I stay because I can still disciple you. I can still teach. I can still train. I can still put the word of God in you. And then in another place, he says, for me to live is Christ. I can't lose there. I get a relationship with Jesus. To die, well, that's gain. That's even better. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Paul can't lose. Which, as we've talked earlier, especially in the earlier parts of the book of Acts, if the devil persecutes the church, he spreads the gospel farther and faster than it, it was going to initially. If he leaves the church alone, the church will grow. Not quite as far and fast, but it still will grow. We cannot lose. The church cannot lose. Then Paul says, now indeed I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I test to you this, testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So here's where Paul really bears his heart. These pastors nearest, dearest to him, he knows this is goodbye. This is farewell. This is a sin. This is so long. This isn't even see you later, this side of heaven. He knows when he leaves this port, he will never see them again, this side of heaven. And so he takes inventory and he thinks about the last three years. I preached in the synagogue. I taught in the school of Tyrannus. Three years I discipled these people. Three years I trained and taught and shared the gospel with these leaders. And then he smiled knowing I did my job. If they believe and respond to the gospel, glory to God. It's all his glory. But if they don't, I'm not guilty. I did my job. I preached and I taught. I fed sheep. If they, came to the, if they came to the table, great. If they didn't, that's not on me. That's on them. And he says, my conscience is clean. My hands are clean. I could stand before God today and say, I did what you told me to do. I am not responsible for their response. That is their responsibility. And then he says, I declared. I did not shun to declare the whole counsel of God, which means Paul preached the stuff that was easy and fun to preach and the stuff that was hard to preach. Now, I did this in the morning class, and it was a fun exercise. I want to do it with you guys. Paul says, I declared the whole counsel of God. And exactly what is that? 
if Paul is, is thinking back to all the topics and all the things he covered in three years, basically if you're a, a school teacher and you want to make sure your students have learned what they need to learn before they graduate or go on to the next stage and you've got three years to teach them, what do you teach them? What do you preach to them? So let's kind of, let's put this together, the whole counsel of God. And, and I want to divide them a little bit into two categories, things that are easy to preach and to hear, things that are hard to preach and to hear. And I want to see what we would consider the whole counsel, everything. So let me just, let, let me start it off, make it easy, kind of show you where we're headed, and then we'll, we'll take it from there and see where we go. How about the first thing? Grace. God gives us what we don't deserve. That's grace. That's unmerited favor. That's, that's easy to preach. God loves you even though you don't deserve it. That's pretty easy. What else? Give me some more. Salvation. Love, salvation. Miracles. Healing. Healing. Well, that, yeah, that would go right along with miracles. Holiness. Holiness. Okay, now. In my opinion, we're going to asterisk the things that are hard to hear and preach. That's hard. Our world is unholy. Our world is sinful, sensual. And we're saying, yeah, but God is calling us to live a life of holiness and godliness to him. That's not easy to preach. Ashley? Strength and encouragement. That's easy. Hey, God's going to give you strength. He's going to walk with you when you're weak. He's going to give you strength. That's easy to preach. Persecution. That's hard to hear. Some of you, and Paul would even say it, Jesus even said it, they hated me, they're going to hate you. They killed me, they're going to kill you. Joy. Joy. Let's go fruit of the Spirit. We'll make that one just all one big fruit basket. Fruit of the Spirit. What else? We're doing great. How about the identity of Jesus Christ, who God is? Now, depending on how people have been taught and trained and brought up, that could be an asterisk because we say, well, Jesus was God in flesh, not just God, not just a person of God, but actually God himself, the Father who came incarnate in flesh. Some may have a hard time with that. Where you are, that could be, I mean, you could, that could be uh, uh, life or death, you know, and even today, depending on where you are. So oh, you sure, sure. Is God and, and that you could be yeah. Yeah, if you go over to, oh, what if one of our missionaries was just from recently, you go over to one of those hostile countries toward the gospel and you preach that Jesus is divine, you'll lose your life. So that's a hard message to preach. Yeah, a lot of those are, that, that's not an easy message to preach. What else? You're doing great. Keep, let's keep it going. Okay. Discipleship is a great word. Follow me. But it also means... What did he say? If you're going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross daily. You'll have treasure in heaven. Follow me. Discipleship is not easy to preach because you're telling people you need to take up your cross and follow him. But all of the benefits are in this world and the one to come outweigh the sacrifice. How there's a word for us. Sacrifice. Never easy. Here's one that's never easy to preach. Good old fa Okay, fasting. Sure. Let's, yeah, fasting. Especially when it's pineapple upside down cake at, at wits. And yes, I do have their whole daily schedule on my phone. <laughs> what are some other things? Yes, ma'am? Uh, I don't know if this fits in there, but he did warn people about hell. Yes, hell. Hell is never easy to preach. Which, by the way, it was also never designed for us. Heaven. Heaven's easy. Hey, there's, there's a place far too wonderful for words prepared for us. Yes. Sin, easy or hard? Absolutely. What's that? Yes, that's right. Forgiveness, there you go. Now forgiveness, let's divide it into two. Forgiveness, easy. Forgiving, hard. Let's go ahead and just bundle it up in one big Sermon on the Mount. And most of that, Hard. Love your enemies. Prayer. Relationship with God. Which, obviously, that could be easy and hard. 
We can have a relationship with God. Praise God. But that means we need to spend time daily with him and in his word to draw close to him. And some may say, whoa, whoa that's, that's a high price to pay. Kind of along with that trust, in God. trust. Trust and faith. We'll put those two. And that's easy as far as knowing that we can trust in God. Having it, not always easy. So, yeah, we'll make that, we'll make that a half asterisk. <laughs> Any others before we go? Breaking away from traditions, okay? I feel like we're playing Family Feud. Don't, like it just, all of a sudden, it felt like Family Feud. All right, check. Breaking away from traditions. All right, let's see if it made our survey. Show me breaking away from traditions. Okay, so let's do this. Let's go, Bible is greater than traditions. How about that? The scripture is the authority, not tradition or, or just history. And that's hard because if people have learned all their life that this is right, and they find out that this is different than that, that's hard to say, wait, okay. Yes, yes. Right, exactly. Yep, yep, exactly. So breaking away from those traditions and seeing scripture as... It's the authority, not our traditions. So, okay, so this is, this is, I'm going to take a photo of this. This is a pretty great list. He also taught against um, segregation. Oh, okay. Let's go with, how about, let's just say equality. And I know that's a loaded word. <laughs> but equality in the sense of all of us are created in the image of God. All of us are image bearers. And all of us are welcome at the foot of the cross. The ground is level. Rich, poor, Jew, Gentile, bond, free, doesn't matter. Everybody is welcome and invited to the foot of the cross. Well, but it wasn't just that. It was he taught against the segregation in the fellowship because he, he faced off with me <coughs> when we were enslaved. He'd already been eating with the Gentiles. Right. And some Jews came down, and Peter was like, Ooh, Yes. Hang out with my Jew brothers. And exactly. Exactly. So. Yes, so he erases the line. For fellowship. Absolutely. So, yeah, fellowship. Yeah. Absolutely, fellowship, which is a great, a great topic. So let's take a look at the board, and let's see, are we, now here's what I want to ask, and this is kind of an evaluation tonight, are we hearing, and am I and others who come through, whether teaching, preaching, in class, in the service, in sanctuary, in the chapel, are we hearing, teaching, preaching the whole counsel of God? Ashley? Yeah, I think hope. Hope can go along maybe with trust and faith and that kind of, let's just put another slash on trust and faith. We'll add hope to it. How about, oh, you know, we didn't even touch this one. Holy Spirit. And then, of course, we have salvation, which is, includes repentance, baptism, and the Holy Spirit. So, are we, and, and, and I want your honest evaluation, when you take a look at the board, are there things that we're just not hearing about? Are there things that we need to cover that we're not covering, not preaching the whole counsel of God? And I'll tell you, it's very easy to find topics that get good response or make people feel good and nobody walks out going, man, I stepped all over my toes. But everybody goes out going, woo, I feel good. And thank God for those services. But I want to be able to stand before God and say, I did what you told me to do. Yes, ma'am? Right, right, right. Exactly. And here's the danger. And I'm running out of whiteboard space. Never thought I'd say that. Here's the danger. <laughs> you have to look past the... There are two extremes for the pendulum. This is truth. This is love. We need them both. To go too far to this side says God doesn't care how you live. He loves you no matter what you do. And then we have a seedbed for sin. To go to this side says no matter what you do, it's never good enough. You'll never make God happy. You're going to burn. And that's a seedbed for condemnation. Where's the balance? The balance is right here in the middle. The gospel. We speak the truth in love. So yes, we have to preach about hell. 
but we preach about it in the context of if you, if you love God and if you will follow Him, you'll never have to taste of hell. God didn't create it for us. He created heaven for us. But it is our choice where we spend eternity. But if all we do is preach fire and brimstone, we're missing this. But if we never preach hell, we're missing this. So the beautiful balance is right in the middle. The gospel, Jesus came so we would not have to go to hell. But we have a choice. and We can go there if we choose to. So I want to take a look, and I'm going to go back over my sermon history and spreadsheet, and I want to see, are we hitting these topics, and are we covering the whole counsel of God? And if not, I'll pray for God to direct me and help me to, to make sure that when you stand before Him, you can be able to say, yeah, I heard about that. And I can stand before him and say, yeah, I, I preached or taught that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yep, I sure will. I don't think we hear a lot about persecution simply because we don't suffer real persecution. Right, right. Um, I'm sure there's places you could go that would. Oh, but, yeah. You know, we look to us sometimes we think persecution is somebody making fun of you for wearing <laughs> a skirt all the time. You know? Right, right. That's not persecution, no, no. But fortunately, that, about the extent, we don't suffer the real persecution. No, we don't. It's very true. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, I don't think they, the person who put it, they might have been kind of laying there and, and you know, really uh, should be a victim or what, or what kind of reason, not to get there. But he goes, well, to me, he goes, you tell me this, he goes, you don't have much of a choice. If you don't serve God, you're going to hell. So he says, you got, you're made to either serve God or you're going to go to hell. He said, so what kind of God is that? A God who gives us a choice. Here's, here's what I tell people. If, first off, the question is wrong. The question is flawed. How could a loving God send anybody to hell? That's not the right question to ask. The right question is why in the world would a holy God allow any of us sinners into heaven? That's the right question. But when people ask that question about we don't have a choice, actually no. If you choose, I want nothing to do with God while I'm here, why would he force you to spend any time with him in eternity? That doesn't make sense to me. If you would say, I don't want to live for God here, then why would God force you to live for him in eternity or with him in eternity? He's going to give you what you ask for. If you ask for, I want nothing to do with you, he'll say, I respect that choice. Kind of like when parents say, can I, or when kids ask the question, can I go over, can I go over, can I go over? Go, no, 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 no. Can I go over? Fine. You know what? I don't care. Just do what you want. And eventually God says, if that's what you want. I've told you, I've warned you, I've sent preachers, I've sent scripture, I've sent, if that's what you want, that's what you, I'll, I'll give you what you ask for. Yes, ma'am. Right. Oh, okay. Words is a good one. Yeah, sure. Life and death and the power of the tongue. That's a hard one to hear. Right. Oh, God, for sure. Right? That's right. That's right. Fooey <laughs> with luck. I like that. I like that. So, yes, ma'am. I was just thinking of spiritual gifts. Oh, spirit, yeah, spiritual gifts. That's a good one. And that one's easy to preach because, hey, God wants to use these awesome spiritual gifts and give them to the church. Oh, sure. Yeah. If you get scared half to death twice, that's a bad thing. <laughs> so, let's move forward. We've got just a few more verses to cover. This is my favorite verse, key verse of Acts chapter 20, one of my favorites, all scripture. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and all the flock among which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. 
Paul refers to these pastors as shepherds. I want you to hear me. Pastors are not celebrities. Pastors, no matter what you see on TV, or you see online, pastors are not rock stars. Pastors are not personalities. People are supposed to follow because they're good speakers. Pastors aren't motivational speakers. Pastors aren't just organizational leaders or managers or CEOs. Pastors are shepherds. And a shepherd's calling is to feed and lead the flock of God. They lead. Shepherds are called to lead the flock and feed the flock. Pastors don't have to be funny. It's great that they are sometimes. Like, yes, it makes it interesting. It's, if you're preaching till midnight, it's a little bit better to hear it. But they don't have to be. They don't have to be entertaining. Pastors aren't, aren't, God didn't call a pastor to impress or entertain anybody. He called us to preach and teach the gospel. We need to love the flock enough to lead them and feed them. Do you remember what we learned from Acts 9? Church growth was not the goal. We talked about that when we studied Acts 9. It's not church growth that's the goal. It's church. <laughs> health, exactly. Health, that's right. A healthy church will grow. A growing church is not always healthy, but a healthy church will grow. And how do we grow physically? How do we grow? No, physically. Like we eat. Exactly, one pineapple upside down cake, witzer at a time. We eat, and that's how we grow spiritually. We, eat. we do what we're doing tonight. We feed on the Word of God. We, we belly up to the buffet, and we feed our souls on the Word of God. We come on Sundays, and we feed our souls on the Word of God. And we erase what we had up there. We do that house to house. We have our devotion. We spend time with God, and we feed our souls on the Word of God. Then Paul said this, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in from among you, not sparing the flock. Oh, let me go back real quick. Paul said, feed the church of God. This is a pet peeve of mine, and I'm asking you to help me out with it. I believe it matters. I, it, it, it hurts my heart when I hear people say, I go to LJ's church. Oh, yeah. No, you don't. Right. This is not my church. I didn't pay for it. I didn't buy it. I didn't purchase it with my blood. He did. And so... I, I will say things like, oh, yeah, the rally is going to be at the church Pastor Enzi pastors or Brother Stark pastors. That's fine. That's biblical. Yeah. But when we say LJ's church, Brother Stark's church, Brother Sheets' church, it's not. Or, now, I'm part of a church. And I will say I love my church. But it's, because it's not mine that I bought or that I am in charge of. It's mine that I'm a part of. So there's a difference there, I feel. But if I... Please help me out with this. If you hear somebody say LJ's church, please say, no, it's God's church. He's just been called to shepherd it. So that's, help me out with that. Okay. Paul said, also from among you, men will rise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So Paul says, hey, I did all of this in three years. A shepherd also protects the flock, leads and feeds it, but protects it. Paul knew, as long as I'm here, you guys are healthy, you guys are safe, I'm going to teach you good doctrine, you're going to know God, you're going to know how to be right with Him, how to walk with Him, but as soon as I leave, I know wolves are coming. And he said wolves are coming from the outside, and even more sinister, wolves are coming from the inside. And wolves are going to try to destroy the flock from the inside, and they're going to try to destroy the flock from the outside. The devil has tried a few things over the years. He tried persecution in Acts chapter Five, six, he tried, seven, tried persecution with Stephen. And what did that do to the gospel? Spread it farther and faster than they ever could have imagined. So persecution doesn't work. And he's tried just blatant lies, but we can see that a furlong away, and we know what's true and what's a lie. But you, he, he tells them he's going to twist the word of God. He's going to distort the truth in order to draw a following. These wolves from inside and outside, are going to put just enough truth in the message to make it sound right when really it's a lie. The most, the most dangerous doctrine is one that sounds right but isn't. It's deceit. And Paul knows, and it pains him. He knows. He knows as soon as he leaves this is going to happen. And so he's doing his best to arm them and protect them to make sure they're ready when the wolves come. Best way to tell the difference between a wolf and a shepherd, or a sheep rather, or, yeah, it would be a shepherd. Aside from the big, long snout and the pointy ears and sharp teeth, a wolf eats sheep. A shepherd 
feeds sheep. And so if you want to know, is somebody coming in, are they a wolf or a shepherd? Are they feeding or are they eating the flock? And here's their motive. Their motive is not to feed the flock of God. Their motive is to draw a flock after themselves. Paul said they want to draw people after themselves. That's kind of that whole idea of celebrity rock star. That's not God's design for pastors. It's shepherds. Right, yeah. The difference between counterfeit and real, you don't have to study all the counterfeits. You'll never know all the counterfeits because they're going to keep changing. But if you study what's real and right and true and, and, and unchanging, you'll be able to notice and tell a counterfeit whenever it comes. And who did that? That's a great segue. Which church, which city? Do you remember? You may not have been here because of your work schedule. Help, help us out. What church was it? that searched the scriptures every day. They said, hmm, Paul, that, what? Berea. Berea's right, good. Paul, you said what? Hmm, let's see. Okay, it's in there. I can listen to that. <laughs> I, was, I was in college and somebody was preaching one time and we weren't responding like this guy wanted us to respond. So finally he said, you know what? Don't worry about if it's right, just respond. Ooh. And I was like, I'm sorry, bro, I can't do that. No, 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 no. I'm not being <laughs> proud, but when I say amen, that means I agree with what you said. And if I can't agree, I can't say it. So, verse 32, Now, brethren, I commend you to, the, to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. After Paul did what he did, after he taught what he taught, he gave him all of that, three years worth of himself. He said, the best thing I'll ever do is give you to God. I can't be here, but he will, and he can fend off the wolves, even if I can't. Verse 33, I've coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You know that I've worked with my hands to provide for my own necessities and those with me. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than receive. Which gospel is that found in? Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? All three? Who said what? Matthew? It's not Matthew. Not Luke. It's not John. And it's not my, that's right, it's not in any of them, that's right. I heard you guys are like, don't ruin it for the class. It's not in any of them. It's funny because the morning class, Mark was the last one too. It's like Mark is just, the, wait, wait, there's one more guy. Oh yeah, Mark. No, it's not in any of them. This is one of those instances where Jesus taught so much more than the disciples ever recorded. Remember what John says, if I wrote down everything Jesus said and did, there aren't enough books and shelves and libraries in the world. What's that? Yeah, that's one of those that <laughs> a friend of mine said this. He, he was telling me today, he said, it was funny on Easter, his pastor was preaching and said, John acknowledges that Jesus did so much more than he would ever be able to write down. Said more, preached more, worked more miracles than he would ever be able to write down. But in all of the sacred scripture, in all the sacred space he used, John did say that he was faster than Peter. Right? <laughs> like, that's what you're going to write, John? Really? He's not going to tell about somebody that he raised from the dead, but he is going to say, well, you know, when it came to the tomb, I did outrun Peter. Well, Moses did say he was the meekest man. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yeah, the meekest man said he was the meekest man. <laughs> and when Jesus said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words he spoke, that they would see his face no more, and they accompanied him to the ship. So when he finishes saying goodbye, and they know this is farewell for good, they walk Paul to the ship and they say, it's been, it's been great. We're going to miss you. And Paul got on ship and he left and he heads into chapter 21, which we'll hit next week. Questions about Ephesians or Acts chapter 20? Yes, Mama. I got another word for affairs, expectation. Expectation? All right. We could, let's put that in with faith. What do you say? All right. Any questions about Acts chapter 20? I have one question for you. Yeah, don't go to sleep. It's dangerous to go to sleep in church. Let me ask you a question. So Paul leaves, and we don't really get to see what happens in Ephesus. Paul leaves, and Paul says, I know savage wolves are going to come in from within and without. What happened to the church in Ephesus? Does anybody know? It was Paul's favorite church. He loved it. 
spent three years longer than anywhere else he ever spent. He spent three years in Ephesus teaching and preaching and discipling them. What happened to Ephesus? That's right, Liz. To answer your question, Liz just answered it. Yes, they fell away because they lost their, they left, not lost, left their first love. Savage wolves did come and they did try to attack them with distorted doctrine and things that weren't true but sounded like they were. And they came in, but they fended off the wolves. They, when, when Jesus writes a letter to them in Revelation, remember chapter 2? He says, you did a good job. You guys work hard, you labor, you keep the doctrine, you're solid. You guys are awesome on truth. What you don't have is relationship. You know all about me, but you do not know me. And Jesus said, you have left your first love. They have swung so far to this side of the pendulum that they fought for truth and they lost sight of the one they should have been fighting for. And sadly, if you go to Ephesus today over in that area of the world, there, are, there is a mosque there, but there is no church. One of Paul's favorite, if not his favorite church, and there's no apostolic or even Christian church of any stripe there because they left their first love. We can never afford to do that. I hope we are solid on doctrine. I hope we can, we can share the gospel with anybody, no matter where they come from, how little they know, how much they know. I hope we can share the doctrine. I hope when wolves come in, they will, from within or without, that we can fend them off, but I hope we can always do it in love, maintaining our relationship with Jesus and with others that we're trying to reach and disciple. So let's make that our prayer. I don't want to see what happened to Ephesus happen to us Let's ask God to help us to hit that beautiful balance of truth and love where we speak the truth, but we always do it in love. Yes, ma'am? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. He must be priority. Sure. Yeah, spend time with him first. He must be priority. Let's pray for this tonight. Help us, Lord Jesus. I thank you for what we've learned. I thank you for your spirit, which I know is here. You have taught us. You have led us. You have helped us. God, I do pray tonight you would help us as we draw close to you. Help us, Lord, to love truth, love doctrine, but most of all, help us to love you. Help us to have a strong relationship with you. Help us to have a strong walk with you. Help us, Lord Jesus, to, to love your word, to love people, to share the gospel with them, to disciple others. I'm asking you tonight, Lord Jesus, may we be the church you have called us to be, not only to love truth, but to love you. You are truth. I pray God use us, demonstrate your spirit through us, work miracles and wonders among us. We're asking you, Lord, use us for your glory. Help us to make disciples and may all of it not be for us, but for your glory. We pray this tonight, and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Joe, do we have any questions online? Okay. I got a text message from somebody. All right. All good. So if you brought an offering, there's a basket right there on the emergency exit row. We are gathering Saturday night, 7 p.m. for prayer, and then Sunday for service, we have a missionary to Luxembourg with us. The favors are going to be ministering and preaching to us. So let's come together expecting God to do some wonderful things on Sunday and share somebody, share with somebody what God is doing and invite them to come along with you so he can be, they can be a part of what he's doing. You're dismissed. Acts 21 next week. Yes, ma'am.